I'm here to help us all get ready for that trip because if you're going to go to Mars, you're going to make sure you're going to pack all your bags and you want to make sure you're going to take uh, everything with you that you'll need to live there. Well, the first thing you're going to need to live there is your own, is your own healthy body, right? So, if you've, uh, some of you have been in my presentations before, I've, I've kind of had a series of them, and that's why I call it Sweet Surrender 2, because, um, and I'll explain that in a minute. But what, what, what this amounts to is a new noble experiment. I come from Georgia, they call Georgia a noble experiment because they, caught, they brought uh, people from the prison systems in old, merry old England to Georgia to start a new life there. So well, it, to establish habitats on a planetary surface where the essential conditions for a sustainable life uh, will be enabled by proper design and maintenance by the founders and settlers. So, you know, an airless, waterless void is quite a challenging thing. Good thing is no natives to displace. Uh, and the other good thing is slavery will be too expensive to import. <laughs> so we'll have to do the work ourselves. So. And this has many uh, implications for us here back on Earth. That's why I'm calling this uh, Better Worlds for Healthier and Happier Generations to Come. A moment for a dedication is dedicated to, to uh, my wife's, my son's, Kevin Gardner, uh, September 12, 1989 to Tuesday, September 30, 2014. He died at the age of 25. And he had mercury in his system. He had a lot of food sensitivities, uh, gluten sensitivity, uh, corn sensitivity. And the thing that seemed to start it all off was uh, presence of mercury in his system. Uh, he had four times the EPA limit for mercury. Uh, let me step back a minute and explain myself a little bit. I'm an environmental scientist. I'm not a medical. I'm not going to make a diagnosis for you. Uh, I have no relation to uh, to, uh, to any uh, medical uh, uh, establishment or enterprise, uh, but, I, but we are in a family business that's a, that is a solely interested in comprised of people who are working on environmental analysis and trying to figure out where all these things are that we're not only eating but uh, absorbing into our system and swallowing. For a little background on this, I highly recommend this book by Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. It's uh, about thimerosal in particular. He's gathered all the evidence about the effect of mercury. It's still apparently an active, uh, it's an active preservative in multi-dose vaccine vials uh, that some, uh, I don't know how often they're used now, but if you have a child who is getting a vaccine, please request the single dose file because they need not be preserved. So a whole life controlled ecological life support system for, for Mars will uh, have uh, two distinct properties which are essential to the connection between Earth and Mars and, and helping our venture to Mars help us here on Earth. The large separation of space between Earth and Mars will both necessitate and enable provision of the conditions for indefinitely, indefinitely sustainable human life on Mars. And the, the, the distinct thing about it will be that the frontier nature of the initial settlements removes the disincentives for reforms uh, to existing medical and pharmaceutical practice and provides a platform for innovation. So, there's no, uh, there's no job anxiety produced by anything we're going to do on, at Mars for, for anybody in the health profession. Uh, a controlled ecological life support system for Mars will be developer settlement. Uh, this is uh, something that we'll take active control of. We only have partial control of our life support systems on Earth, and that's where, that's where the devil is in the details, and that's why we rely on a medical model now to uh, uh, help us stay healthy and to restore us when we're not. So, um, but on Mars, we'll, bring, we'll have to have our own air and water, nutrients, waste handling, energy input management, and co cooling, and we'll have the possibility of a notobiotic design. Uh, what that means is that we will, we will not only select the humans that come, we'll select all the other creatures that come with us. Uh, the, um, so I asked at the beginning, are, we, are, are you and I getting ready? Will we be able to go to deep space for a three-year round trip to Mars? 
Are we getting healthy enough to go to Mars is the question. Before we say, sure, maybe, consider that known risks have actually increased in the last year, but one has actually been addressed successfully. So here we have a scorecard for uh, physiological problems for going to Mars and living in, on modern Earth. There, there's some definite similarities. Bone demineralization and calcium loss, okay? If you go to NASA and you talk to Scott Smith, he had a video on NASA to the effect that um, we consider this under control. As the, so the problem is solved. It's manageable. It's manageable only with difficulty because astronauts have to spend a lot of time with the uh, uh, resistive exercise. They, uh, they tout the advanced resistive exercise device as the machine that has enabled this advance. Um, and uh, they've also been aided by dietary changes, uh, that is pH balancing with an alkalinizing diet, and I'll talk more about, about that later, about a particular experiment that's been running at, uh, on board the ISS we're getting data back from. Uh, sensitivity to free radicals, toxins, and oxidative damage. Uh, here we need to establish contemporary baseline studies for the stat status of our own homeostatic systems. I was uh, interested to hear a uh, speaker earlier, Doctor, I'm sorry, um, speak about the radiation damage and we can't really disentangle oxidative damage from uh, space ionizing radiation from all the other uh, sources of it in our diet and, uh, and environment. But, the re but in the last few now years, now we have identified ophthalmic changes in the IS, uh, ISS astronauts, uh, changes in the, uh, uh, in the structure of the eye, uh, choroidal fo folds, cotton wool spots, uh, swelling, um, swelling of the optical disc. Uh, they all relate this to the shift in fluids and intracranial pressure brought about by poor fluid management in the human system. So we need to study the role of epigenetics, uh, microbiome cardiovascular injury and developmental plaques that are weakening vascular function and fluid balance. See, I'm talking like a doctor. I don't usually talk like this. I guarantee you it's all about the lead and the mercury and all that stuff. So any doctors in the audience, please speak up. Now that's not right. Please say so. Okay, so how safe is safe enough radiation risk for a human mission to Mars? Uh, the earliest uh, speaker, Doctor, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Parker. Parker, thank you, Dr. Parker. He talked all about this. God bless you, sir. I'll skip that slide. So <clears throat> what we already know, <laughs> a healthy human anywhere has the natural genetic capacity to re repair damage at the cellular level by DNA repair and replacement systems, but it's limited by carbohydrate metabolism, for example, and the oxidative damage by acidity and ionized metals. Now these, these, these latter, you know, the, oxi the carbohydrate metabolism is, is uh, coincident with, uh, I mean, the consumption of co uh, carbohydrates and grains is coincident with the start of civilization. So that's been going on 12,000 years. But um, uh, I heard an interesting statistic just the other day to the effect that dental problems are, have only occurred in the last 150 years. Why would that be? Is it due to the, due to the dietary sugar? No, actually it's, it, it, it started with the Industrial Revolution when women went to work and they could no longer breastfeed their babies for two to three or four years as they normally did. Teeth prior to that time in the skulls of almost every human being found were just nearly perfect. They had all their wisdom teeth, they had no malocclusion, their jaws were in great shape. So ladies, you know, stick with the kid as long as you can, please. <laughs> Okay, so this study was done with uh, uh, C. elegans a few, just a few years ago, showing that dietary glucose in, in the little nematode downregulates common genes responsible for cell protective mechanisms and longevity. So you got a control here, I don't have a pointer, but you see the control, the glucose and the control. The black line in this one is, um, is the, um, uh, uh, is the, is the uh, organism that hasn't been uh, exposed to glucose and the gold line is. So you see how that's shorter than the other one. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the C. elegans has a, a very similar respiratory system to humans because it can utilize glucose as an energy source and it has uh, insulin and other enzymes to, to manage that. So what happens is that uh, in, the, in the presence of glucose, uh, the, the release of insulin is stimulated, which, which induces glucose uptake. 
and insulin-like signaling, uh, but inhibits the FOX0 DAF16 enzymes, which positively regulate the enzymes and other stress resistance and longevity genes. So in other words, when, when insulin is circulating, the other genes responsible for DNA repair are inoperative. So high glucose levels may, may increase uh, cellular reactive oxygen species, actually. And C. elegans disease events all appear to occur in the intestine, although insulin-like signaling responses can occur uh, among tissues, too. So uh, the U.S., th this is the good old uh, 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 food pyramid. It's not real focused here, but um, which have been in operation since 1972. And you're uh, probably most familiar with this because uh, the grains and the starches and everything are at the bottom of the base of the pyramid, the broadest part of the pyramid. And then you've got veggies, fruits, thorough up, meat, fish, milk, yogurt, and fats, oils, and, and uh, sweets uh, used sparingly. So, uh, and boy, do we follow this religiously because the consumption of pasta and grains and bread has just gone up and you can't go to a grocery store without seeing fat-free and, and um, healthy grains and enriched wheat and all those good things. But now, um, uh, Dr. Martin Blaise, and I'm speaking as a student today too. I read these books and I want to see the books I'm reading because I, I read a lot of books and I point out a few that I think you would find especially interesting. So uh, Dr. Martin Blazer is the head of the um, uh, U.S. Microbiome Project. You remember the, the genome pro Human Genome Project. Well, the Human Genome Project was uh, no longer was it completed than we discovered, oh, there's a microbiome there that actually affects the genome, the human genome, and it actually interacts with it. And the microbiome is those, uh, those uh, guest organ organisms, if you will, that are ten times greater in number than our own. Bear in mind that we have 20, 23 trillion of our own cells and there's ten times that many guest cells within us. Uh, the mass is less, it's about one or two kilograms if you could take it all out at one time. So there's a new global battlefield, if you will, within us that comprises our natural planetary defenses, as I call it. But other doctors like Dr. Alejandro uh, Junger, who I believe practices in New York, describes the detail in a, uh, the detail effects on our gut and immune system. So what happens is that inflammation is initiated in the gut when tight junctions of the epithelial tissue of the small intestines loosen. Uh, there's a, just a cascade of events here. Uh, you've got uh, inflammation, you've got loosening of the tight junctions. So now toxins, undigested food particles, parasites and harmful bacteria can enter into the bloodstream including yeast and fungi and, and other um, uh, adventitious organisms that are not normally there. So you can understand how that's going to send the immune system into, uh, into overdrive. Uh, and here's some more detail about this. Uh, gluten is a big player because what happens with gluten is that um, it's a very difficult to digest uh, protein in the first place and if you have enough of it, it will actually form a biofilm in, in your intestines and uh, that biofilm is just a lovely place for more uh, organisms to come and, and take root. So if we look at basic uh, homeostatic, homeostatic principles, the blood pH must be maintained by the body at a slightly alkaline pH of 7.3 to 7.4. The interesting thing about that pH range, it's the only range, in, it's the only pH at which hemoglobin can exchange oxygen with carbon dioxide. You get much outside, below this range, you've got metabolic acidosis and death quickly ensues if it gets too much below that range because respiration stops. You can't exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen. So the body jealously guards that pH range. It does, has all kinds of mechanisms to maintain that. And it's not maintained by us. You know, uh, unless you've had a traumatic injury, uh, it's going to be maintained. It's going to be in that range. So uh, most food items in the standard American diet now, that food pyramid you saw there are, are acidic or mildly acidic, acidic when they're digested. And in the absence of adequate dietary alkalizing sources, the body resorbs calcium from the bones under the action of uh, parathyroid hormones to neutralize the acids. So, uh, you know, that's, that, that's the basis for osteoporosis. Uh, for those of you who are, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with pH, does anybody not know what a pH is? Okay, 
So, I mean, this is a range of pHs. Coffee has a pH of 5. I'm going to be asking today, getting ready for this presentation. But other things like baking soda, pH 9, seawater 8, uh, lemon juice down at 3, hydrochloric acid 10% 1, hydrochloric acid 100% 0. Sorry? <laughs> okay. So, um, interesting comparison here. I, my, uh, my research of mythology tells me that the ancient yin-yang symbol are a symbol of, um, of pH. <laughs> okay? Alkaline acid with a little bit of each in each other's side. And there's an interesting comparison between that and the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe, dipole anisotropy map. So, makes you think, doesn't it? <laughs> Now, there's a nutritional biochemistry lab at Johnson Space Flight Center, which, uh, which uh, my company has been in touch with uh, since the early, uh, since about 2004. Uh, in 1986, prior to the development of that branch, we, uh, we had a, a, a flight surgeon from the Navy come on board with us at, and agree to be the principal investigator. And we had another, um, on a, another year, we had a, a pharmaceutical researcher, uh, Dr. Shabir Massey, come on board with us to make these proposals. Neither one of them were funded. What they proposed to do was to study uh, how dietary protein changes affect human bone turnover. Uh, the, um, the clinical evidence was rather massive at that time that uh, we lose calcium irreversibly uh, in the presence of acidic species. In this case, uh, we had learned about proteins being an acid that, uh, uh, and there was a definite correlation in Skylab astronauts between the amount of their protein intake and their loss of calcium through uh, urine discharge. So, uh, there are lots of other benefits besides staying alive <laughs> with a, a pH neutral diet. Proper functioning of the body's hormones and enzymes are highly pH dependent. They're all optimized, I don't have a chart for this, but they're all optimized in that neutral range. You get outside that optimum range, they don't work as well. Uh, an internal environment that is less favorable to harmful microorganisms uh, is, uh, is one of the benefits of pH neutral because m most of the uh, adventitious organisms are, prefer a little lower pH. Not real low, five or six in that range uh, is, uh, tends to be optimum for things like candida. But, and with adequate oxygenation, micro, which includes, has to be microvascularization, environment unfavorable of uh, fungi and oncogenic retroviruses uh, is established, and so you, you have an environment with a neutral environment that is less favorable to the operation of microorganisms that uh, lead to cancer. So what, what do we need to know on an individual level? Are we in a pH balance? Do we have one or more of the known abnormal conditions resulting from systemic pH and imbalance and, and leaky gut? What is our pH status? How can we be evaluated for leaky gut simply and inexpensively? So um, there's uh, what we call biomarkers of preclinical pre turbidity can be um, uh, can be gleaned from a pH test, like a system pH measured with saliva and urine. And another is a live blood cell examination uh, or, and or specific culture tests. Uh, these other things, uh, EKG body temperature, are kind of ancillary to that. They, they help, but, but in my own uh, family and practice and dealing with the, the gluten issues, we found that the, that the pH had a, had a better correlation. And this backed up in uh, clinical literature uh, I'm sorry, in, in um, uh, biomedical literature showing that, uh, uh, that, that pH, uh, a drop in uh, pH is correlated with, uh, with more morbidity and, and the, um, the presence of, uh, uh, of, of uh, parasites in the blood are, are, are correspond with uh, uh, increased uh, morbidity in, in test fish. So pH and a live blood cell mark is a good, are good measures of, of pre-morbid conditions. In other words, you can run these tests long before you ever get sick. So you can, you know, if you, if you look at your blood and see those things in there, uh, I know I was completely healthy when I, when I had my first blood, blood test done, and, uh, but there was a lot of junk in there. <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, part of my bowel movement is in my blood supply now. So. 
I've got a, I've, I, well, I use these diagnostic strips, and again, I'm not making a medical diagnosis, but I'm going to pass this around. There's plenty in here. Please take one if you, uh, and take it home with you or, or lick it and compare it to that chart up there. And uh, keep it to yourself. I'm, I'm not asking for a public demonstration of your health. So live blood cell tests, these are a few, uh, f these are a few examples here. A normal red blood cell uh, microscopic slide looks like this. You know, the little donate sh donut shaped uh, cells, uh, anucleated cells that uh, look very smooth. It looks like they could go through anything and, and they look quite healthy. You'll, you'll see some other white blood cells and some other things, platelets that can show up at this level of magnification. You can't see viruses. Uh, but there are things that do happen, uh, like you can detect here with this method. Just by looking through a uh, standard polarized light microscope, you can see conditions like poikilocytosis, which is oxidative damage to red blood cells. Uh, you can see protein linkages, and, and that makes this, uh, the uh, RBC stick together. They can even progress to Rouleau syndrome, where the red blood cells will pack, uh, stack up like pancakes. And I first, when Kevin first had his first test, they are all stacked up like, like in stacks of, stacks of 10 or 20 cells. And this is on a slide. It wasn't in his blood supply that way, but as soon as it exposed to a little bit of air, they stuck together like that. So prepare yourself to go into deep space. Heal and maintain your gut. And that's, that's the, the, the bottom line here. Improve alkalinizing content of the dietary intake. More vegetables, less proteins, starches, and grains. Uh, the recommendations I'm seeing by the people who study these things, like uh, Dr. Hyman and uh, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Smith and Dr. Brown, suggest an 80-20 volume rule. Greens versus everything else. 80% of your volume should be vegetables or greens, and 20% everything else. Maintain the flora with probiotics and prebiotics. Grow your first and second brains. Why do I say that? Because there are no more neurotransmitters in the gut than there are in, in the brain. Maintain adequate vascular perfusion through exercise and deep massage therapy is necessary. That's, I get that done once a week. Uh, I try to keep up with my aerobic. Today I'm just running my jaw, not my leg, so don't know if that'll help as much. Uh, reduce the intake of simple carbohydrates, processed sugars, natural sugars, starches, and grains. Special conditions for life extendable uh, controlled ecological life support systems on Mars. Uh, to provide for a physiological balance for pH near neutrality and integrity of internal membranes. Minimize the release of uh, an exposure of toxins and wastes. Maintain notobiotic census of all organisms. Minimize compromising agents such as most grains, gluten, and simple carbs. And grow and maintain foods high in macro and phytonutrients, that is, antioxidants. So better for us to follow the recently revised USDA food permit. Yay, they finally got the message in the government that we've known for 30 years. <laughs> Minimize carbs and elevate healthy oils. So now, so now you got watch less TV as part of the recommendation here too. Exercise, run. Yeah, that's why you got shoes now. The shoes are not there to eat. <laughs> They're to put on your feet and run, okay? Uh, but the olive oil is, okay? It's there to eat. And, um, uh, eat a healthy breakfast, but you don't see, you don't see donuts here, do you? <laughs> you see bread, you have whole grains, and, and, and uh, uh, people who look at these things say uh, non-gluten grains just to be on the safe side. If you, so uh, another book I recommend is Dr. Mark Hyman's Eat Fat, Get Thin. He highly advocates, based on clinical studies, uh, a 50 to 70 percent uh, caloric intake from fats, from fats in the diet. So, um, when we go to Mars, uh, we might think about paleo, too. And so, I recommend this book, Eating on the Wild Side. Uh, wi you know, wildly grown foods, asparagus, endive, all those nice little green veggies and colored veggies. They say eat the colors of the rainbow. You saw that on the pH slide. So, and the, you know, they, they was cute at NASA and the ISS. They, uh, they flew, uh, they finally got some green veggies growing on the ISS last year and they had a, a, a little uh, thing on NASA TV saying, one of the astronauts saying, that's one small bite for man, one giant leaf for mankind. Okay. So we now get ready to go to Mars with us. Okay. You think that's doable? You have, you, have you improved your chances of going to Mars after seeing this? Now you know what to do, right? Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, 
so can we get healthy enough to live on Mars so we can get healthy enough to stay on Earth? The answer, most definitely. Thank you. Well, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a, that is a matter of intense study in the space station. Uh, and, and they have uh, identified problems with, uh, with fungal overgrowth on the station. They, in the twin studies, you, you know, with, uh, uh, in, the, in, in the twin studies uh, last, last year with the two uh, twin astronauts, they found that, uh, uh, I think it was Scott on board, uh, Mark on the ground, had developed big differences in their microbiome. So the space environment has an effect on the microbiome. They don't know quite how to interpret that. And also I might add uh, that the ocular changes I, 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 I mentioned, that was aboard the space station too. I got that paper from Scott Smith and Sarah Swart, which is the topic of actually. Uh, it's the one you have, the first question was, where is, where is your abstract topic here? It's, it's not, I don't see it <laughs> up here in the, in the PPT. Well, uh, it's, it was there and I just shortened it down to the ophthalmic change page because uh, they have discovered uh, that there's an uh, aberration of the so-called one carbon cycle that's, that's related to, the, to in, in human studies, we know it's, uh, that, that organisms like toxoplasma can affect the one carbon cycle, which is uh, the uh, methylation and uh, control of, uh, of, 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 the, uh, uh, of the genetic structure. So, uh, but prior to methylation, you, you, if you get into uh, mental health studies, there's a lot of stuff about methylation, under methylation, over methylation. Uh, Dr. Walsh, in particular, uh, in his clinic, ha uses this uh, uh, genetic analysis to determine uh, treatment with supplements and, and change the diet to improve outcomes for uh, psychiatric conditions. Uh, but, the pro but, the, but the caveat is that none of that works if you've got oxidative damage. So you've got to clean up your diet first and you've got to get rid of the stuff that interferes with the operation of the, of the system. And it includes getting rid of the, the microorganisms like toxoplasma and, and others which manipulate, the, which manipulate the genome via the epigenome. And the so it's complicated. It's complicated, and I've tried to simplify it, see? If you get in the right pH range and do some simple checks, that's the simple approach, because all that goes away. Oh, I see. Yeah. And we start to function normally. Tony, some of the uh, mission architectures show people carrying uh, room temperature ready to eat meals, basically. Yeah. And uh, you'd be eating food that had been stored for that would be a lot of preservatives, a lot of nitrates in the water service. Yep. How does that uh, reflect on, on your... Uh, it's, it's just the opposite of what we should be taking to live on Mars and to survive the journey. It's exactly the opposite. It's, it's the standard American diet in spades, isn't it? Preserved, <laughs> stored. Mm -hmm. I think Dr. Moscatello here, do I recognize you? Yes. He has, he, he's, he's showing us how we can grow plants and, you know, vegetables uh, to take in space. Are you not, sir? No, that's just some of my colleagues at Kennedy Space Center. Oh, at Kennedy Space Center. You're doing it at Kennedy yeah. Yeah. Space Center. It's the veggie experiments. Yeah, the veggie experiments, you bet. And uh, uh, along with that centrifuge, we need to put in uh, some little gardens, you know, aeroponic, uh, hydroponic gardens to carry our food with us. Yeah, so, so yeah, we, we need to get away from preserved foods, we, we, and we really need to do it for the Mars journey. We, we, we really do. Any other questions? Have I got your stomachs turning by now? <laughs> yeah, back. So I understand some of these vision changes that some of the astronauts have experienced uh, have not been seen in female astronauts yet. That's Does that mean we can only send women into deep space, or do they need to stay home and breastfeed? <laughs> well, you can, you can get the same problems if you want to take testosterone and androgen because it's correlated with, uh, with those two hormones, 
they kind of up, they, um, in, in, um, through the process we don't understand, kind of uh, allow, the, allow those uh, processes to occur. What happens is there's accumulation of homocysteine. So medicals here know that homocysteine is not, is not good for you. But the homocysteine that they find in the astronauts, which is about 30% of them, about half of these issues, and the other 70 percent seem unaffected. And those 30 percent, they fall within a normal clinical population. That is, people who come into labs all over the country, they establish norms for homocysteine. And they didn't detect this before because that homocysteine levels that the astronauts have are in that level, but now they know that it's, it's, it's a substantial enough level to relate to this one carbon cycle abnormality, which is, which is just uh, a problem with expression of you know the MTFR, MTRR and the, and the MTHFR genes that regulate the one carbon cycle. So those those are due to single nutri single nucleotide polymorphisms, that is mutations to the to those uh, to the genes that produce those enzymes uh, that are become less than optimally functional, and that's oxidative damage. So. All right, thank you very much. Okay, who's going to have a salad for supper? <laughs> <laughs>